very much indeed for us. Um, Obviously, a, a critical election has just been concluded in a Kiti governorship election. It's the one that's being seen as a marker, as a sort of pointer on the way forward going into 2019. What's your assessment of how that election went? Well, I think, I think the Kiti elections um, tell us some important lessons. First of all, my greatest concern, uh, my concerns are two. Allegations of vote buying and how the security uh, um, operatives were used uh, in the few days before the elections. Um, first of all, I think it's clear that we are in a state of slavery to the corrupt and recycled political class. And the way they have kept Nigerians in slavery is using poverty. They keep us poor so that when elections come, mm. they can give each one of us 5,000 Naira to 10,000 Naira and get their way. So there were allegations of both parties trying to outbid each other in vote buying. Mm. And this is just sad. Then you had uh, civil servants whose salaries had not been paid or some entitlements had not been paid for some time receiving alerts uh, a couple of days before the election. What, a, what fine timing. Um, and then you had the police, security agents, treating the state governor in a manner that just tells you that the security forces of this country serve no other purpose but regime protection. And is it your sense that the APC, the ruling party, was flexing its federal muscle and bringing it to bear in order to, as it were, move that election in their favor? Without a question, without doubt. And that tells you why this country needs to be restructured and why the Constitution needs to be amended to devolve power, including security uh, uh, powers, to sub-national units. I mean, the federal government cannot use security forces to be advancing the political, partisan political interests of the party in power. That means that our democracy has very little meaning. But was that actually what they were doing? Because looking back on that, that uh, altercation, if you like, between the governor and security forces, the, the, according to the police, there were clear instructions that rallies were not allowed to take place. And, and one was being organized, and, and the, the police went in to break it up. And, and the governor just happened to be there. Well, that's, there are many stories, but I think it's very clear that there was an inappropriate use of force by the security authorities, especially on the person of the governor. Um, so, you know, people can provide any rationalizations they want, but Nigerians are not all children. I think it's very clear to us what happened. The security forces were used to intimidate, to harass the opposition party, and it was all to advance their own agenda. Um, now, that doesn't ab absolve the opposition party of certain actions, for example, the allegations that they themselves were also engaged in vote buying. So the question is, what is really the state of our democracy? What does this election mean for 2019? I also want to say that Ekiti, though, is a very unique state. Mm. The stakes there were particularly high for both parties. I should hope that the elections of 2019, broadly, across the board, uh, will be far better uh, conducted. Well, what do you think should happen now? Because the, the PDP, the opposition PDP, who were occupying Government House until this election yes. in, in Ekiti, are talking about going to court. It, it, do you think there's enough ammunition, evidence for them to take this to court? Or is this another example of politicians simply refusing to accept defeat? Well, there's not, you know, it's not for me to say. Uh, I don't have um, enough involvement in that direct situation to be able to judge the level of evidence uh, one way or the other. But certainly, I mean, if the PDP wants to go to court, they have the right to. Um, that's, that's what happens. Our laws allow that, and it's happened in several cases in elections in Nigeria. Sometimes those who go to court may win. Sometimes they may lose. It all depends on the evidence, and that's for the judges and the mm. judicial system to determine. Well, let's talk about something that you clearly are familiar with. And, sure. and uh, it, it, it's something they call the Loch Ness Monster of Nigerian politics. Yeah. Everyone's heard of it. There are occasional reports of sightings of it. But no one's really sure if the beast exists or not. And we're <laughs> talking about who's in bed with whom politically yes, in right. terms of the coalition partners. Yes. There are rumors swirling around that your party 
could be in coalition discussions with either the APC or the PDP. What's your As take on I that? I can tell you that there are no such discussions going on, to the best of my knowledge. Um, the Young Progressive Party, the YPP, of which I am a member, um, decided that they would not go or be part of any coalition of the old, recycled, tired political class that has created the problems that our party exists to try to get Nigerians to solve. Mm. Um, so we cannot, um, when we say we are trying to solve a problem, get into bed with the problem. Mm. Um, so I individually, as a presidential aspirant, made it very clear, immediately the coalitions of the PDP were announced that I would not be joining uh, that coalition and that it's not the answer to Nigeria's problems. Some would argue, though, that your chances of winning the election are increased by you joining one of those coalition movements and that they're less so if you remain on your own. No, I, I actually argue very differently. With the coalition that the PDP has put together of about 38 parties and the APC and their own alleged coalition, I think that the old recycled politicians have put themselves into a political grazing reserve. That's very clear. So they've bunched themselves up, and I think the path has opened up uh, for a genuine third force to emerge in Nigerian politics, which I believe um, I will be in a leadership position uh, to represent. So uh, I think this is far better for Nigerians mm. because the field is now very clear, and it's either you want the old or you want something new, different, and bold. The choice is very clear now. You are, of course, someone seen as, uh, well, not, not seen. You are actually deputy governor of the Nigerian Central Bank, and, and therefore someone who is seen as believing in liberal capitalism with its unswerving confidence in the merits of the free market growth, enterprise, entrepreneurship, and wealth creation. Is that essentially your third way philosophy in Nigerian politics, a sort of benevolent pragmatism? Um, or, or is there the element of sort of a philosophy that asks, essentially dissects each government policy and tries to find out if it's good or bad and, and whether to take it or not? That, the latter is where I stand. Broadly, though, I believe in entrepreneurial capitalism mm. and I have no apologies to offer for it. But I believe that it should not be the dog-eat-dog dog type of capitalism or the kind of capitalism where we leave the poor to their own devices. No, the government has a role to play. And part of the success of capitalism is understanding the balance between the government and the marketplace. So I believe that markets should function, but I believe that the government has its own role to play. There mm. are certain things the government has a fundamental duty to provide and should not be left completely to market forces. But broadly, I believe in market mechanisms. We are not, we shouldn't be a communist country. We mm. shouldn't be a socialist country. We shouldn't be a welfare state because we cannot afford it. Mm. We don't generate enough fiscal revenues to run a welfare state. So therefore, I believe that entrepreneurial capitalism, Nigerians are very you know, um, enterprising, very dynamic people. And mm. we all know that. But the government is to provide them with the enabling environment. And that's right. what I will do as president. And that's why I talk about the creation when I come into office in 2019 of a one trillion naira venture capital fund that will finance the beginning or the establishment of new businesses by millions of unemployed right. Nigerians. So, so a form of benevolent pragmatism, really. Yes, that, yes, that, That's is. really what you're it espousing. But, it, but it's a business investment. It's not free money. It's not right. a woof, as they say in Nigeria. <laughs> so what do you think will determine who wins the presidency in 2019? What do you reckon will be the deciding factor? I think at the end of the day, as we get closer to the elections, the stakes will rise, the issues will become clearer to the people of Nigeria, and I think they will be faced with a, a very blindingly clear choice about whether they want to continue going backwards into poverty or whether they want to move forward into the 21st century, whether they want to continue with the old recycled politicians or whether they want a new technocratic and visionary leadership. I believe that the latter will prevail, but it will happen gradually as things evolve and the coalitions that all these uh, behemoths have gotten themselves into, we're very, very happy about it because it helps us along in clarifying the situation.
Kingsley Moalu, the presidential aspirant, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant as always. Well, thank you.